Welcome to AH University, brought to you by Aggressive Hydraulics. In this presentation, Tony Casasa, the engineering manager at Aggressive Hydraulics, will help you understand the essentials of hydraulic cylinder sizing. This five-part series will delve into the primary aspects, including direction, force, distance, speed, and power. This is the second video in this series, which examines the concept of force. So that's direction. The next thing we're gonna talk about is force requirement. Uh, so we talked about the direction of the force, but we're also gonna talk about the size of the force that's required. So for a compressive force, uh, again, we have our simple example of the rod up and a weight on the cylinder. Here we have pressure acting on the full bore area of the cylinder and force capacity is gonna increase one for the same cylinder, it's going to increase with increasing pressure. And two, if we increase the bore size, so say the cylinder on the left is a small bore cylinder, the one on the right is a larger bore, the larger bore cylinder is going to be able to supply more compressive force. And we see down here our equation where pressure in typical units in the US are pounds per square inch. Can we multiply by area in square inches to equal the force? So we have a given force and we have a cylinder with a given area. The pressure required is gonna be that which overcomes the, the load of the weight and causes it to move. So if we have a specific example here, say that load, that number, that dumbbell on top of the cylinder weighs 10,000 pounds, and say our target operating pressure is 2,000 PSI, which makes the math really easy. Uh, we rearrange our equation and we divide force by pressure, 10,000 divided by 2,000 tells us that we need five square inches in the bore area in order to lift 10,000 pounds with 2,000 PSI. So we have our bore diameter, which is just the area of a circle um, based on the diameter and rearranged to solve for the diameter. And that tells us that we need a diameter of 2.52 inches. Well, that's pretty close to two and a half inches. Uh, so we may pick a cylinder with a two and a half inch bore. Now we can plug that back into our equation and it tells us it's actually going to take 2037 PSI to move that 10,000 PSI load. So next, if the force is in the tensile direction, uh, we now the pressure is acting on the annulus area, uh, which is the red area highlighted in those two examples. And now our force capacity is going to increase again with increasing pressure, uh, again with increasing bore diameter. But now our force capacity actually increases with a decreased rod diameter. And we can see in these two examples, where we have the larger gray circle depicting the larger rod, we have less red area, whereas when we have the smaller gray circle depicting a smaller rod, we have more red area, so we have a larger surface for the pressure to act on to retract the cylinder and pull up this load. So if we put some numbers on it, if we stay our load is still 10,000 pounds, and we, our desired design pressure is still 2,000 PSI, uh, our required area is still five square inches. So that equation is the same, but what's changed now is our equation to determine the area, since we're looking at the annulus area instead of the full bore area. And so now our area is the full bore diameter and then subtracting out the area of the rod. And that tells us that uh, if we tried with a three and a half inch bore with a two inch rod, that would give us a six and a half square inches, which is more than the five square inches, so that would work. We may then wonder if we could bump the rod size up, say to two and a half inches. But with a three and a half inch bore and a two and a half inch rod, we only have 4.71 square inches, which doesn't meet our minimum. So we'll go with a three and a half inch bore with a two inch rod. We can plug that area back into our equation and we can calculate that with that selection, it would actually take 1,543 PSI to retract this load. So when we have a bidirectional load, we need to look at both load cases. We need to look at both the compressive and the tensile load. 
So we'd first look at the compressive load and determine the bore diameter required to meet that load. Uh, and then we would look at the annulus area. So we have a bore diameter, we'd pick a rod size, and we could calculate and see if that provides an adequate amount of tensile force. If not, we need to increase the bore diameter. If yes, we could look at potentially increasing the rod diameter if it's feasible. So again, we'll look at some numbers. Uh, we'll look at an example here where the compressive load again is 10,000 pounds. Uh, but we'll say the tensile load is smaller, it's only 7,000 pounds. Design pressure of 2,000 PSI, again we have our minimum bore area of 5 square inches and we already figured out that that tells us we need a bore diameter of at least 2.5 inches. Um, we can do a quick calculation to make sure we don't have a rod that's so small that it's going to break under the load. Uh, but we can see that it only takes a 0.34 inch diameter rod uh, to be able to handle that load. So if we, with our two and a half inch bore, if we look at an inch and a half rod uh, and we calculate the force that can be generated at 2000 PSI with that two and a half inch bore and inch and a half rod, we come up short. We only have 6,283 pounds. So probably don't want to go any smaller on the rod size, so it makes sense to increase the bore diameter. Uh, so we go to three inch bore and we'll pick a two inch rod and at 2000 PSI, our math tells us that we can get 7,854 pounds of retract force, which exceeds our minimum. So this seems like a good choice. One word about induced loads uh, with an example of our crane boom hoist. So typically we're designing uh, for a non-induced load. So this is when the cylinder itself is moving the load and we're supplying flow and pressure to the cylinder in order to do so. Uh, so we move the cylinder, move the boom up and down. Now we stop moving the cylinder and the cylinder has a load holding valve and it locks it in position and it's going to require some higher pressure in order to open that load holding valve. But now say we use operate the winch on the crane and we pick up a weight. If we pick up a heavy weight, it's going to increase the pressure in the cylinder and this would be called an induced load. As long as it's also within the rating of the cylinder, it's fine. But it could be that a higher load could be pulled and a high induced load could be created that causes the cylinder to fail. Another example of an induced load is a tie bucket, so a grapple on a rail maintenance equipment. Again, we have a non-induced load. The cylinder is made to open and close that grapple or bucket and grab onto ties so then the boom can lift them up and move them around. So it's a pretty low force requirement, just opening and closing those, uh, that grapple um, and holding it closed while the ties are moved around. However, if the operator uses the boom to push or hammer ties with the bucket, it can induce very high pressure spikes into the cylinder, higher than what the cylinder may be intended or designed for. This concludes part two. Be sure to check out the remaining videos linked below. Visit aggressivehydraulics.com and try our custom online apps, including our hydraulic cylinder calculators and quoting applications. Contact us today to start your purpose-built process.